Today's story is Raventown Part 2 by Akash Sharma. I still fear the darkness, for in the dark there lie things beyond our understanding. Things that lurk around, waiting for the absence of light. Daisy had been first seen limping on the sidewalk a few hours prior. She did not appear as an extraordinary sight, rather, quietly walking along the path, looking right ahead as if lost in a trance. Her clothes appeared to be totally unscathed by the elements. They remained clean and intact. She looked quite alright herself. Her hair was neatly combed in a way that she had always done it, and her skin appeared to be untouched as well. She had found her way into the orchard diner and sat down to order two full apple pies and a glass of orange juice, which the owner, Miss Carol Booth, had gladly served up, free of cost on recognizing her. She appeared to be completely fine, not a scratch on her, as she began to shove large chunks of crust and apple fillings down her throat, not taking a moment to say anything. According to Miss Booth, she acted as if there was absolutely nothing wrong besides the monstrous hunger. By the time the police had been called, and Daisy had been brought into the town hospital, she had already finished her meal in the sheriff's car. He brought her some sandwiches after she had claimed to still be hungry, which she had started to then devour in his passenger seat. Is she... My sister barely spoke out to the sheriff who stood in the hall, next to the room where Daisy was being tested for a rape and possible drugs in her bloodstream. We don't know yet, ma'am, but we will find out what happened. I promise, he assured her. The sheriff was a rather tall man. He was in his mid-fifties, I assumed, which I later found out to be wrong. The man was in his early forties, but he seemed to age much faster for some reason. I need to see my baby, Walter said, ignoring the sheriff standing in front of him. In a moment, Walter, they need to run some tests, the sheriff said. Bullshit, Walter said, now staring the man down as if trying to intimidate him. I guess the biker thug in him was looking for a reason to spring out and cause mayhem, after it had gotten a slight taste of violence just a while back, eager for more. Now, Flanagan, I understand how you feel, but you have to keep calm. We need to know what happened to her first, the sheriff said, patting Walter on the shoulder. The door to the room opened, and a doctor walked out, looking awkwardly at the parents, and then at me, and finally at the sheriff. May I have a minute, officer? The doctor said. Walter was about to intrude, but Abigail kept a warm hand on his shoulder, giving him a teary, moist smile, as if telling him to be grateful for their daughter's return. I saw the brute in him die at that moment, as he gave my sister a warm hug and nodded compliantly. I felt a touch against my shoulder and turned around to see a nurse walking away from the room toward the elevator. For some reason... Her uniform looked very out of place and too skimpy to be an actual nurse's outfit. That was when the woman turned back to reveal herself as Cindy de la Croix, the porn queen. She motioned for me to follow her, seductively winking at me and walking away just out of my sight. I started walking as quickly as I could to keep up with her pace. She was too quick for me, and even though I knew that this wasn't real, I was compelled to follow her by something in me. My heartbeat grew louder, dimming out all the other sounds from the environment as I got closer, and it got warmer. Eventually, I became so lost in my trail that I bumped into a child and tripped over, falling on my shoulder, thankfully not my jaw, and dropping the kid down too. I picked myself up and blinked myself back into reality. The child picked himself up and patted himself with tiny arms couldn't be older than 13 or 14, he looked at me blankly and frowned slightly. I'm sorry, kid. I, I didn't... I started out my apology, but then he walked closer to me and told me something right in my ear. What he said haunts me still, and at that time it was no different. That is not Daisy, he said through a slightly trembling tone. Wait, what? I asked, more confused than anything. She's in the farm. He finished, and then stepped back, as if afraid of me hitting him, and something told me that he was used to being hit. 
As those words started digging into my mind, I began to feel colder and my spine tingled. The boy then raised his hand, as if holding an adult's hand for guidance, but holding on to empty air and walking away from me, turning back every few seconds to look at me as he kept walking with whatever imaginary friends he held hand with. The farm. Somehow those simple words sounded much more ominous in the given context. The words kept running in my head over and over again until it pained me to even think about it. But a thought is like a parasite, and a mind is impenetrable. By the time I had found my way back, now with two coffees in my hand for Abby and Walt, I saw a sight that I had never anticipated to see as long as I had existed in this miserable existence. Walter was in tears. Abigail held whatever was left of this man together in her embrace as he let himself go in her shoulders. Abigail looked at me with tearing eyes, but she managed to stay strong for her husband. Daisy had been raped several times, and as far as the doctors could tell, there were multiple proprietors, several vaginal tears and signs of forced entry. She had also been violated using several objects involving branches, bottles, and possibly even a kitchen tool of sorts. The toxicology report was pending at the time, but later, there were found to be traces of amphetamines in her bloodstream. What kind of monster does that to a child? I had seen some shit in my time as a private investigator, but this was just too personal to me, and it deeply broke me and sickened me at the same time. Now I felt what Walter probably felt when he gunned down that kid. I hungered for vengeance. I'm gonna kill him, Abby. I'm gonna kill them for what they did to my baby. Walter said between sobs. Abby gave me a look, and I left the hall to give them some space. I was too fucked up to relieve myself in the hospital bathroom, and neither did I smoke or drink to lessen my pain. So I did what I did, and took myself a seat in the bench outside the hospital with a stone on my heart. Jesus, the way I felt at that time. Anger, guilt, sorrow, fear. It made a deadly concoction. One that was enough to drive a man to violence, and I accepted it. The people that did this would not get away. I was so lost at the time that I never saw Officer Atwell even take a seat next to me. I'm sorry about Daisy. We're going to find these animals, he told me, trying to reassure me. I noticed that same kid from earlier, now walking around with a woman that I assumed to be his mother, getting something from a vending machine. I was lost in that sight, focused on the snack the vending machine had deposited for the child's guardian to collect. Look, I understand that you are angry, but don't go looking for revenge, we will get them. Atwell stopped. What's the deal with that one? I asked him, my gaze fixed on the kid. Oh, um, Atwell was slightly confused by my sudden and unexpected intrusion. He's got some, uh... Issues? Schizophrenia, he said. I nodded, ending the conversation and getting up to leave. Atwell held my hand, steadying himself as he stood up, even though he was a young man. Remember what I said, please. He then left with a pat on my shoulder. Kyle had said something about her being taken by ghosts. I had to look into that first. I was not going to force Daisy to relive that hell by asking her anything right now and I hoped that the officers did the same, at least for now. Let her rest, she has been through enough. As I left the hospital, I got myself a coffee and decided to spend the night at the chandelier. The pain was too much to bear and perhaps a little something could help. Hey, I heard someone call out to me on my way. I turned around to see the short blonde woman who had served my niece before her way to the hospital. You're Abigail's brother, right? She asked out to me. Before I knew it, I was already sitting down at the diner after closing time with Miss Booth, helping myself to some late night coffee and a sympathetic ear. I felt comfortable in this place, a feeling Raventown had always disregarded. She bit her lower lip as she listened to me rave. She was a good kid, it's just, it's sickening to think someone would do something so awful to her, she said. I honestly wouldn't mind if someone fucking had these animals hung for the town to see. I liked this woman. I liked her company. She made me feel a way I hadn't felt in a long time. 
Now, I find it a little funny. I thought that I loved this woman. I can't tell you why, but for some reason I did. And there was nothing more I wanted at the time than to have her give me that sympathetic look with her lower lip pinned between her teeth. It was truly an amazing feeling. One that sadly came to an end when Ms. Booth had decided it was late enough and decided to head home, offering me a ride, which I declined. I know what you're looking for. I heard someone whisper in the cold air. Uh, Carol? I turned around to see that Miss Booth was already gone. A cloth brushed up against my face, blinding me for a moment. In my emptiness, I could hear the familiar giggles of Cindy. She was walking away from where I stood, her hand extending back holding mine. Come, let me show you. She said through a red grin on her face. Her hair flowed as if it was windy, but the night? It was still. Her white gown flowed over me, engulfing me in the stark white nothingness as we walked to seemingly nowhere. I didn't know where she led me, but I didn't think too much about it for some reason. Close, she said, and I obeyed her commands. She was in control, or so I felt at that moment. I smelled copper in the air, and with the overwhelming dread I realized where I was. The blood of whom I could only assume was Kyle Fleck had been under my feet coating the leaves that I had stepped on. It wasn't fully dry yet, and for some reason, the stench was strong enough to take hold of the forest atmosphere and invade my sense of smell. I looked around. Cindy was nowhere to be seen, at least not anywhere alongside me. She stood up on a branch, and with a sickening twist of my gut, I realized that she had a noose around her neck tied to the tree. She gave me that seductive wink one last time, and then jumped off the branch with a snap. I didn't know what to do. I didn't even know what the fuck I was seeing at that moment. So I did what mankind has learnt to do when we felt even the slightest touch of fear. Run. I ran away from the place that I saw the horrendous sight, fearing that she would be back and lead me to that tree again, but it didn't happen. I sat down by the road once I had cleared the woods and felt a strong compulsion to cry. I do not understand why it happened, but I cried for what must have been quite a long while, sobbing uncontrollably like my sister had done when she was a baby. The police were already talking to Daisy by the time I had gotten back. Apparently she was willing to talk to the police now, and she showed no signs of emotional damage on doing so. She spoke with such ease, recalling horrible acts that were done with her without as much of a hint of discomfort or fear or even anger. It seemed like she didn't feel anything anymore. The doctor was puzzled at this as well. She had shown no signs of any head injury, and even though there was no diagnosis of internal injury to the head either, it seemed very unlikely. The man who hurt me was named Joe, she said. That's what the others called him, she spoke. Did you see what he looked like, Daisy? The sheriff asked her. Just try to remember. I don't remember much, sheriff. I never saw any of their faces much, like I said, she spoke. Is there anything else you remember, Daisy? Not really, Sheriff. I was asleep most of the time, Daisy said, finishing her sentence by looking directly at me. Okay, Daisy, you're safe now. Take some rest and we'll talk in the morning, alright, darling? The Sheriff concluded and left the room with a little nod to Abigail. Walt was nowhere to be seen. As a matter of fact, I don't even remember seeing his bike anywhere around the parking spaces. Daisy, Abigail said when the last officer had left the room. Do you know who this is? She asked, placing a hand on my shoulder. No. It's your uncle, my brother Ed, she said. Daisy said her awkward hello, and I returned with an equally awkward nod. The door opened and Walt stepped in, concealing the grim look on his face with a forced smile for Daisy, and then motioning me to see him outside. I want him. I don't care what it takes, but we need to get to whoever did this before the sheriff does, he told me. Yeah, I know, Walt. I- No! Listen to me, man. We're gonna find who did this, and I need your help, brother. When we do find them? Well, the sound of loud footsteps across the hall interrupted our conversation. And on seeing the well-suited man coming toward us, What about the fucking dead body in my trunk, Walt? Huh? I asked in a hushed tone. Just don't worry about it. I've taken care of it, he said. Mr. Flanagan, I'm so glad that Daisy's been found. How is she now? said the man. She's well, not like the cops did a fucking thing, Walt replied. 
My baby girl had to walk back on her own. Yeah, law enforcement is a joke around here, the man replied. Hi, I don't believe we've met. I'm Tom Skye. Walt here, he's a good friend of mine, besides a co-worker. Ed, I'm Abigail's brother, I said, shaking his hand. From what I gathered from the man's appearance and mannerisms, he seemed to be rich and also appeared to be a restless sort of person. The dark bags forming under his eyes told me that this man was usually awake at this time. I'm gonna go check on Daisy, Walt said, excusing himself. Ugh, fucking animals, Tom said after Walt had left. I say cut their cocks off and let them bleed to death. He probably noticed my confused glance. Oh, the sheriff is a good friend of my dad's, I'm sorry. What kind of work do you do? I asked him to end the awkwardness that had followed the last comment. I'm into exports. Walter is into... exports? Nah, he owns a motor repair shop which I happen to co-own, he said. Hey, I don't want to bring it up over and over again, but if you need any help and anything at all, I mean, let me know. Please. Daisy was like a niece to me as well, and whoever did this, I would be really happy to help in getting her justice, he said, handing me a business card. Raven Enterprises, it read along with his name and number. Thanks. Tom turned around to leave, when I asked him something that had been burning inside me once again for some reason. Maybe it was the hospital, maybe it was Daisy being awake again, maybe it was... I don't know. But I had that question in my mind once again. Say, I asked. Tom turned around. Do you know of any place called... The Farm? Tom froze for a moment. I knew this expression instantly. The same face I had seen people pull when they had been called out on a secret. Being in the field of work I was, these kind of secrets were deadly. Some schizophrenic kid said it to me, so, well, I, I don't know if it means anything. I said, ah, Billy. Well, I wouldn't take his word. Not exactly. He motioned toward his head, balanced, poor kid. With that, he left. Now, I was a little bit confused, but I couldn't think of any rational reason to this. It was around 4am and I was very tired. Perhaps I did overthink it. If I was going to find them, I needed to think straight and that wouldn't happen without some rest. I woke up in the morning, rather, I was awoken by a nurse I had passed out on the bench where I had indeed spent the entire night. The first thing I had to do was read the papers. I needed to know what the people knew first. I didn't exactly know how much the sheriff's department told people, but if this Joe person knew, he could go into hiding, making it much more difficult for me to find him. There were only mentions of Daisy being found and nothing else. No mentions of what had happened to her or anything of the like. I was actually grateful for this. It could be a lifesaver for me, but even then, I must act fast. In a small time, word travels fast, and I needed to reach Joe before this information did and sent him away. There was, however, another article, this time in the national paper, that caught my eye. In bold letters it read, Famous porn actress age 31 found hanging in apartment. No, this, this had to be some kind of fucking coincidence. It can't be. And I didn't need any of this on top of whatever was happening, but I couldn't help reading between the lines of the article. Cindy de la Croix. The word stabbed into me, leaving a bitter taste as it did. What the fuck was happening here? Something wasn't right, and it sure as hell wasn't. No, I didn't grieve for the woman, I barely knew her. But after seeing what I saw last night, I really don't know. The morning was a little hard to get through. My mind was jumping around several things at the same time, Joe being most prevalent, but there was something else too, Kyle Fleck. His father would soon realize that his son was missing, and the idea of what he might do when he does, it made me nervous. I half expected him to jump me at any time, asking me the whereabouts of his son, but that didn't happen. Odd, but welcome. It was about 11 or 12 in the AM when I decided to call the number on the card. Tom agreed to help me go over the sex offender records of Raventown. He had pulled a few favors at the sheriff's, and he was allowed to have a look at the records. Around 4, 
I was at the gates of Tom's house, which was quite unremarkable. A person like this is expected to live in a huge mansion with foreign workers tending to the yard, but no. Instead, he lived in a quite simple house, one that wasn't as huge as I expected it to be. For a moment, I assumed that it didn't really belong to him, but my suspicions were proven wrong when I saw the name Sky on the front door. Another thing that struck me as odd about this man was the lack of any doorbells, and I actually had to knock. Even then, he took quite a while to open the door to me. The house smelt of incense, and when I say that, I mean it really smelled of incense. It was so prevalent in there that I actually had to ask him about it. <laughs> Spreads positivity. It helps me think better. That was his only response. Tell me, I asked. Tom, he replied. Tell me, Tom, what made you buy this house? Don't get me wrong, it's a nice house, but wouldn't a person like you want to live in a much, you know, fancier place? I asked, now anticipating an answer related to perhaps an emotional childhood connection. What he actually said caught me off guard. An empty place is a devil's nest, he said. For a moment, I was completely taken aback by this strange answer. And I also can't stand my old man, he said, lightening the air a little bit. I didn't reply to that, but instead went over to the records. Joe, Joe, Joseph, anything related to that name could help. Jared Martin, the name read, 44 years old and registered as a sex offender. I said this guy, <clears throat> it said this guy used to work as a school janitor, apparently from his record and the record I put together, that this guy was probably the guy. He was named Joe and I assumed that he was the closest to Daisy here, working for the school and all. This is our guy, I pointed to Tom. Jared? He asked with puzzlement. Yeah, you know him? Not really. I saw this guy a couple times around town, didn't even know his name until now. The detective in me seriously doubted every word this man spoke. I can't say for sure, but when in this field of work you tend to pick up on things. Maybe it was his indifferent nature, or his odd choices in lifestyle. Maybe his confidence in each word he spoke he just seemed off. And following that hunch, I just looked into his face, trying to catch even the subtlest hint of deceit. The buzzing phone halted my process and I went back to focusing. Jared Martin, 6'4", tall man. Yeah, whoa, what? Jesus fucking Christ. The phone conversation had my ears perk up and listen in on the conversation. I didn't need to ask. Officer Clarence Fleck. Well, he... Fleck? That was Kyle's father. I felt my stomach twist. What the fuck was he going to tell me? He... He killed himself last night. Deputy Clarence Fleck. The man whose son lay dead in my car. A result of my own actions. Had killed himself? He had left a suicide note, apparently. And it wasn't officially made public. Even with the help of Sky. He told me he was unable to access the note, and I gave up on it. The cops hadn't come for me, and I took that as a good sign. Now, there were a few things on my mind. Firstly, I needed to find this Jared person. I couldn't let Walter find out about him before I did, and I convinced Tom on this, although I wasn't really sure of his word. Secondly, I was a bit concerned about Fleck's suicide. I wasn't so sure if he had even left a note in the first place. I barely knew Tom, and years of experience had taught me all levels of distrust. Finally, did Cindy De La Croix's suicide mean anything? I was pulling on thin strings when it came to this. I was super unsure if it meant anything, or it was just a morbid coincidence. Even though it didn't seem important at the time, I felt like it was... well, it was something. <laughs> By night, I had told Walter that I hadn't found anything. The majority of the police force seemed to be more concerned about Fleck's suicide than looking into Daisy's case anyway, and even though Abigail didn't like it, and Walter didn't like it, I saw that as a good thing. Less police involvement, even if for a little time, meant less caution on the perp's part. Less caution meant more mistakes, and I was just hoping the guy stayed in town. Walt had decided that Abigail needed some rest that day, and I actually vouched for it. The poor woman had been so tired. I can't even begin to imagine her pain, 
and the sleepless night she had been through? I convinced Walt to stay with her. Some rest would do him good, I told him. I volunteered to stay with Daisy at the hospital, where she was still under observation. Her indifference to her experience was troubling, especially to the psychiatry unit over there. I was falling asleep around 9pm. I had a tiring day, and it wasn't like Daisy was the most talkative person either. I remember drifting into the darkness, just when I heard that same sickening snap from my vision again and woke up in a haste. Daisy was looking straight at me when I woke. There was something odd about her stare. It looked... familiar. No, it couldn't be. I must be dreaming. No, no, no. I began to panic as Daisy gave me that wink that now I have come to dread. Come closer, she told me in a voice that was completely different pitch from her own. Daisy had a soft voice, like a 15-year-old girl would normally have, but this sounded too high-pitched, too womanly. Don't be afraid. Come closer, she said. And, out of total confusion, I did what she told me. Closer, she whispered with a little giggle. I leaned in closer to her now, close enough for her to whisper in my ear. Flep is in the farm, she said. I froze for a moment, trying to take in those words, just when she let out a blood-curdling scream that made my heart jump up to my throat. I tried to back away, but her screams had me frozen in place. A few nurses and a cop ran into the room to check up on us, but just as Daisy caught sight of them, she grabbed onto my head and reached in for a bite, tearing into my ear. I let out the loudest cry of pain that I guess I ever had, as I felt her teeth draw blood from the skin under my ear. I kept pulling away, too afraid to hurt her, but I knew that if I didn't, she would tear my ear off, so I knocked her over the head and fell back on the floor. I kept letting out soft coughs, blood covered my face, and the white hospital bed and Daisy's gown. I could even taste it in my mouth, that overwhelming taste of copper and warmth assaulting my senses. And before I knew it, I was drifting into darkness. The last thing I heard was Daisy still screaming in what I could only assume was dread, while the cop came up to check on me lying on the floor, bloody and fading. So that, my lovely listeners, was Raven Town Part 2 by Akash Sharma. This story is really starting to... <laughs> Hopefully it's starting to make you want more, because this chapter is a good one. Akash did a fantastic job, and I think he really really deserves credit for this, because this, this whole series was just a fantastic well, friends, I hope you did enjoy it, and if you did, please do consider hitting that thumbs up button there on the little section below the video. And if you're new to the channel, or if you really just like my voice and haven't decided to hit the button, please do consider hitting that subscribe button. Helping me grow my channel means I get to do this more and more, and I love doing it, so I'd appreciate it. Lastly, down in the description, you'll find a link to this story and a link to a page where you can submit a story to me if you have one you want me to read on my channel. All of that said, my friends, I hope you're doing well. I love you all, and yeah, just I'll see you next time. But until then, sleep well.